The last type of erosion is waves and ocean currents. So whenever the, a lake or ocean water meets land, um, the water is going to interact with the soil and therefore um, it creates a situation where soil can be washed away, which is a, the process of erosion. Okay, so first waves, that's the up and down motion of water. Um, in an ocean, if you are out in the deep part and um, a big wave was to kind of come through, you would just be lifted up and then back down. Um, so a lot of times people think waves do a lot of like pushing forward, but they don't always necessarily. Sometimes it's more of just like a circular motion that goes up and down, kind of like a bobber. Okay, causes of ocean waves. Oops. We've got the moon, that's like one of the big ones. So the tides, as the moon is kind of moving around the earth itself, it's going to have this gravitational pull on the ocean water, which creates high tide and low tide. Undersea earthquakes, that will create a tsunami, which is like a massive wave. And wind is the third one, that's kind of the most common. The stronger that the wind is, the, the larger that the waves are going to be. So if you've ever been to the beach, especially at the ocean, if it's really, really windy out, then the waves are also really bad. If a hurricane, a big storm was moving in, then the waves would be large because the wind is really fast. Um, I'm just going to move ahead to this picture. So this is showing kind of like just this circular motion that's inside of our water. So as the water is kind of circulating around, it pushes things forward. Um, so in this case, this ball, pretend like it's a beach ball. If a wave was to move through, the ball would go up and then go back down. As you get closer to the shore, the depth of the ocean is going to decrease and it gets more shallow, which means that all of this energy gets confined into a small space. And as the energy is condensed, then the waves can get bigger. So usually there's like a surf zone uh, where you, you can see really big um, cresting waves. So right here, we've got breaking waves in that surf zone area. These waves, as they crash and hit the, the soil and the rock, are going to create sand and they're going to break it down. Okay, so a couple different features that are going to show up. The first one is a headland. Let's go to the picture. So a headland kind of looks like a peninsula, like a little tiny one. Usually they put lighthouses on the end of them, and that's because um, if you were in a boat kind of going along the ocean, you would not want to, you know, crash into this, especially if it's dark out. So what happens is that the waves are crashing and eventually over time, this sediment is going to break away and the land is going to move back farther and farther. So this lighthouse will have to move it um, eventually because all this rock and soil will be washed away. You can even see right here, there's like remnants of where there used to be a headland probably like hundreds, thousands of years ago, but it has since been washed away by the water. You also get bluffs or sea cliffs, which are just kind of really steep, kind of sharp edges, but these are all formed from the waves crashing into the land. We can get some sea caves that also happen. Sometimes there's like a soft spot in the rock that when the waves hit it, it just starts to crack and break away there. And it's like a domino effect. Once it starts to break down, then it gets easier and easier to wear away. And you're left with these little holes. We also can get sea arches, which would be kind of off of the headland, but the arches are in the water and they just kind of make these really cool, pretty features. Sometimes what happens is that if I have a sea arch that breaks off, from the mainland, then you can get these little sea stacks that are formed. Okay, so with your shoreline features, um, since waves usually strike the shore at a bit of an angle um, because of refraction, we get something called longshore current. Now, if you've ever been to the ocean before, you have to be careful of something called a rip current, or sometimes they're called rip tides. And what that is is if you are out swimming in the ocean, if the current is just right, um, you get, kind of get like sucked out into the ocean. And it can be a really kind of scary thing because, um, especially if you're not a good swimmer, you, you're going to get pulled farther and farther away from the beach. And in order to get out of one of those currents, you have to kind of swim parallel to the shore and then gradually make your way back 
to the beach itself. You're going to have to swim a longer distance, but if you were to try to just go perpendicular straight back to the beach and go against that rip current, you would it would drain all of your energy and, it, and that's where you're going to find yourself kind of in trouble and a lot of people um, have a hard time getting out of that. So I'll show you like a picture. So you have your beach, waves are coming in at an angle, so you would want to swim parallel to the shore and then kind of gradually make your way back to the beach. If you go straight back perpendicular, um, you'll, that's where you lose up all of your energy. So a lot of times what can happen in terms of deposition is since the waves are coming in at this angle, that all the sediment can be moved along the beach. So if I started with maybe sand up here at the top and the waves are moving down in this direction, this sand will gradually migrate and make its way down towards like the bottom part of the beach. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead of this a little bit. Um, beaches, in terms of beaches, you can have like a really young beach and you can have an older beach. Typically, older beaches have very fine sand. This is a black sand beach. Whatever the composition of the rock was that was originally there, for instance, this is in Hawaii, and if I have some igneous rock that was black in color, as the waves are breaking it down, it just gets broken down into smaller pieces of black rock, therefore black sand beach. You can have like pink sand beaches, there's all different kind of variations of beach in terms of color. This over here would be a young beach, and that's because the rocks here are a lot larger. Most people don't go to this type of beach because you don't want to like put your towel on these large rocks. It's not going to be very comfortable. Um, but they, these both are categorized as beaches. You also can get sandbars. And sandbars are kind of like little islands, like just offshore, where you have an area of land that sand kind of just deposits and makes it really shallow. Um, people like to park their boats out on a sandbar because then people can get off the boat and swim, and you can, a lot of times you can touch kind of in that area and, um, and things like that. Then we have a spit, which is not what you think it is. <laughs> A spit is when you have a sandbar that's attached to a part of the shoreline. So like here you can see the coast and then I have a sandbar that juts all the way out, kind of loops around. Um, so sandbar connects to the main shore. A barrier island. Oops. A barrier island is going to be, um, you know, a, a kind of a large section of sand and soil that you can actually put houses on. So the biggest example would probably be like the Outer Banks in North Carolina, if anybody's been there before. So these houses, there's not like tons of houses, but there's a couple rows of houses that are on here, but this soil is not very stable. Um, these houses are kind of in a lot of danger. If a hurricane was to come through, then it could just wash all these houses right away. Um, but it is a very pretty place, so people like to live here and um, visit and spend time. But essentially a barrier island kind of sticks out, really similar to a spit, but on a little bit larger scale. So putting all the features together, we have a beach, there's a spit, a sandbar, um, and then your sediments like to flow at a longshore drift, which means that they're moving kind of at an angle um, down the shoreline itself. Alright, there's a couple different types of shorelines. Um, you have an irregular, which just means that it's young, it's very uneven, it's not very consistent. A coastal plain would be a flat area along the coast. Places like um, North Carolina are on a coastal plain area. Then we have fjords. A fjord coastline is where you have glacial troughs. Um, if we think back to when I talked about Norway, and remember how if there was a landslide, it could create like a tsunami, a wave would come in and kind of take out that village. They have a fjord coastline there. And then a regular coastline means that it doesn't have very many like <clears throat> inlets or coves. It's just kind of pretty much um, straight. <clears throat> Okay, so that kind of sums up um, the wave section of erosion. Okay, the last part of this unit talks about landscapes. 
So the features of Earth's surface at the interfaces between the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and the top of the lithosphere. So basically, landscapes are things that you probably are familiar with. They'd be like mountain, plain, and plateau, kind of like the shape of the land itself. So characteristics of landscapes include the slope of the land, like is it steep or is it flat, the shape of the feature, and its drainage pattern. When it rains on top of that landscape, where is the water going to go? For instance, if it was a mountain, then the water is going to flow down each side of that hill. Um, so the slope of your stream, soil properties, and evidence of human occupation such as cities and mines also will affect your landscape regions. Okay, so there's three major landscapes. We have a mountain, a plateau, and a plain. Now, off the top of your head, you probably know the difference between each of those. A mountain is a very high elevated area. A plateau is a high elevation, but it's flat at the top and then a plain is just flat land. Now, each one of these is made out of a different type of rock, and that's how you can tell the difference between them. So the bedrock characteristics are very important to determine the difference between a plain, a plateau, and a mountain. So a mountain is usually composed of igneous and metamorphic rock. Because if you think of the process of how did that mountain form, well, I needed to have a volcano. Volcanoes have igneous rock, or I needed to have two tectonic plates that crashed together and pushed upward, and that would create heat and pressure, which is metamorphic rock. So in order for an area to be considered a mountain, the bedrock characteristic means that it has to have igneous and metamorphic rock. Okay? Then a plateau. A plateau is usually made out of sedimentary rock. Sometimes it can be made out of igneous rock, but for the majority of it, it will be sedimentary. And then a plain is a flat, low-lying area, which is also made out of sedimentary rock. So we've got sedimentary rock, sedimentary rock, and then a mountain is either igneous and metamorphic kind of combined together. Okay, some pictures. Here are some nice pictures of mountains. You've probably seen them before. <laughs> a plateau high elevation but flat at the top. Here you can see it has layers to it because this is sedimentary rock because plateaus have to be a sedimentary rock feature. And then for your plains, there are two types of plains. You have a coastal plain which is near the ocean and then you have an interior plain which is found kind of in the middle of the United States like the Great Plains, but still flat areas. This one even has the picture of a stream going through it, and it's a meander. So we talked about that when we did stream erosion. Okay, so landscape regions. A region is a, a, a kind of a large area that has a certain characteristic to it. So characteristics include elevation, bedrock structure, stream drainage pattern, and soil characteristics. So we have this map here of the United States. We can break the U.S. into different landscape regions. So the middle of it is the interior plains because it's very flat and low lying. Over here where we have the Rocky Mountains, that's going to be a mountainous region. Um, down here where we have the Grand Canyon, we've got the Colorado Plateau. The Grand Canyon would be categorized as a plateau region. And then over here, kind of near the coast, we have the coastal plains. And then for us up here in New York, we have the Appalachian Uplands, because we have the Appalachian Mountains, as well as um, other kind of mountainous features in that area. All right, so for the mini lesson, there are a lot of questions that have to do with this page in your reference table. So page two says the generalized landscape regions. So there's got this little key here, which you can use to figure out what each of like the lines are going to represent. But essentially what we're talking about here is it's breaking New York down into the different landscapes. So the bottom part here is the Allegheny Plateau. And I'm just going to click one more. Um, so the Allegheny Plateau has the Catskills as part of it. Now for us, we refer to the Catskills as the Catskill Mountains. And if you were to hike there, they, they look very similar to mountains, but if you were to examine the rock of the Catskills, it's sedimentary rock. 
And if you remember what I said, sedimentary rock is going to be either associated with a plateau or a plain. So the Catskills are actually not, they're actually not mountains. They are part of the Allegheny Plateau. So this whole region right here is considered a plateau made out of sedimentary rock. Up here in the Adirondack Mountains is the biggest portion of New York State that has metamorphic rock because that is classified as a mountainous region. Um, for us, we are for the most part in the Erie Ontario lowlands, which means that we are in flat low-lying areas. We don't really have a lot of like big major hills around here. Um, the dump does not count because that's man-made. Okay, so there's a couple ways that you can change a landscape. Um, the first would be by tectonic activity. So a volcano, earthquake, plate, plates crashing together, that could change a mountainous region to something that may be a plain. Leveling forces, so weathering erosion can break down the rock and smooth it out, so that could change a landscape. And then the impact of an asteroid or some sort of space rock. If a piece of rock comes to the earth and smashes into it, yeah, it would probably change um, the way that it looks. Okay, climate and landscape development. So for climates, you have arid, which is dry, and then humid, which would be kind of really wet, lots of rain. A very dry climate is going to have very steep, sharp slopes. There's not going to be any plants or vegetation. So the southwest United States, think like Arizona, places like that where the Grand Canyon is, that's an arid climate. They have like a cactus, but there's, it's all rocky. There's not a lot of vegetation. Whereas humid, that'd be like us here in New York. When you look around at the landscapes, we have a lot of vegetation, there's trees, and therefore our mountains and stuff are kind of more rounded, not as sharp and jagged. So picture-wise, this would be like the Grand Canyon, sharp, jagged, no plants. Whereas for us, humid, nice and smooth, gentle curves because the rain has kind of smoothed everything out. Okay, the primary reason that New York State has several landscape regions is that various regions have different bedrock characteristics. Okay, so this is in bold because it comes up a lot, especially for those practice questions. So the bedrock characteristics will determine the shape of the landscape. What I mean by that is, what kind of rock does it have? If it's igneous and metamorphic, it has to be a mountain. If it is sedimentary, then it's either going to be a plateau or a plain. Remember though that the plateau could be um, igneous rock, but that's a little bit rare. So the characteristic of the bedrock will determine the landscape that it has. Uh, we know that some rocks are more resistant to weathering than others. So the metamorphic rock is stronger and therefore those mountains, it's harder to break them down. Whereas a soft rock would be like marble. We know that that bubbles with acid and breaks down really easily. Um, I'm going to move on here. An escarpment is like a steep um, cliff. Let me show you this picture. So an escarpment is a fancy word for a cliff of rock that is exposed. Now, if we have water flowing over the top of this, then that becomes a waterfall. So the Niagara Escarpment is probably one of the most famous ones because it's like a massive cliff that has water flowing over it and you have this huge waterfall, which is like an attraction that people can go and see. Okay, then we got stream drainage patterns. Um, when you get to these, okay, don't panic. I know that um, these are kind of difficult to identify, so we will kind of do a little bit more practice with them, but don't panic because at first it is kind of hard for people to identify these. So it's the path that the stream would take when water like falls on land. So when it rains, where's the water gonna go? So I'm going to go through these. Um, the first one is dendritic. It has this branching appearance. It's one of the most common drainage patterns. So let's take a look at it. Okay, so that would be just like a regular sloping hill. So if I was to pour water on the top of this, I kind of get this tributary where I have smaller streams that all flow into one common stream. And then it just flows straight 
down the hill. There's no other features to this. It's just straight, flat, moving down the hill. So that was dendritic. Rectangular, you also don't need to memorize the names of these, so don't panic if you're like, I'm never gonna memorize <laughs> um, these names. Rectangular would be when you kind of have like this edge where maybe like an earthquake or something shifted the land. And you can see that there's this line here so that if it rains, all that water is gonna pool and you get kind of, wherever those edges are, you have these kind of parallel lines that are flowing there as well. Then there's annular. Annular is when you just have a regular dome. This here is gonna represent some igneous rock. So maybe like a volcano pushes magma up and then it solidifies. But maybe the rock that's on top of it is a little bit softer. So as it's eroding away, you have kind of like these jagged steps that are on the outside of it. So when it rains on top of it, it kind of creates these rings where the water is going to pool, and therefore this is the drainage pattern that's created. Then we have radial, radial going out in all directions. Let's look at this one. So this is like a volcano, but there is no rock on the outside of it, it's just smooth. So if I pour water on the top, it just flows down straight in all directions. And then there is trellis, and the trellis is kind of like troughs. You have these little like kind of U shapes where the water pools in there. And once again, I have these kind of parallel lines where the water is gonna fill in. Okay, so time and landscape. Basically what this means is that I can take any landscape. I could take a mountain, have weathering and erosion, wear that mountain down, and then turn it, turn it into a plain. So any landscape region over thousands, millions of years could change into a different type of landscape. Okay, so that sums up all of the erosion units.